Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our services. Thank you for coming out to PCF, Pepperell Christian Fellowship. Thank you for coming out to be part of our gathered worship this morning. Uh, this is a reminder for us as we look around and see others that we are gathered as the church. The church isn't this place. It's not a building. It's the people. It's the people of God. And so we're gathered as the, the people of God, and so we're grateful that you're here uh, gathered with us. And if you're new visiting or visiting this morning, uh, just thank you for coming and being part of the church. Uh, and if you're new to our church or church in general, uh, we're just thankful that you've chose to spend your morning with us and would love to get to, to meet you as well. Well, it's that exciting time of year when everything's starting up, all ministries are starting up here at PCF, uh, so I have a, a bunch of things to tell you about that are starting up for the fall. Uh, that starts with our service hour change in September, uh, September 18th, uh, is our first service will stay here at 8.30, so this doesn't change, but our second service changes back to 11 o'clock, uh, so if you're going to attend the second service, just be Mindful of that, and on that same day, adult education, PCF Kids, uh, our prayer group, all start back up in the 10, 10 a.m. hour. So uh, looking forward to all those ministries coming back and us to be gathered uh, for more learning and growing uh, in Christ. Uh, women's Bible study is starting up as well. Uh, Tuesday evening study will start up on the 13th uh, at 6.30 uh, there, that, start, that study meets every other week, and they'll be studying a book called Jesus Through the Eyes of Women. Uh, subtitle is How the First Female Disciples Help Us Know and Love the Lord. Uh, so that's going to be a, a great study. And then also our Tuesday morning women's study uh, was scheduled to start the same day, but there's been a change to that. It's going to start on September 20th, uh, so the week after. Uh, that's a 10 a.m. study. There is child care for that. Uh, you'll just want to uh, let them know uh, that you're, you're bringing your, your kids there. And then they're studying Galatians. Uh, it's a Tim Keller study on Galatians. Uh, you can order those books online. Uh, it's probably the easiest way uh, to get those. Uh, and then make sure you register, ladies, if you uh, register online through, there's a link in the PCF News, or you can email the front, our church office, uh, info at pcfchurch.org, or just call the office. Uh, the one thing they're doing differently this year is there's no in-person registration. So just wanted to make sure you knew that that's the way we're, we're handling the registrations this year. Uh, youth group, we're back to our regular season this Tuesday. So we'll be meeting here at PCF, normal times, 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And so this week will just be our, our year kickoff. Uh, so hopefully you can, you can come out and be a part of that and be with us as we start up small groups and all the, the normal activities for the youth group season. Uh, life groups also starting back up. And so whether you're already in a group from last year and, and prior, or looking for more information about a group, there'll be a life group opening potluck on Wednesday, uh, the 21st, here at PCF at 6.30. Uh, that's a great way to reunite with the other groups and even your group after, if you haven't seen each other throughout the summer. Uh, but also, if you're interested in getting into a small group study, which I really recommend that you do. It's a primary way to go deep with other folks uh, past Sunday morning. Uh, so that's a great time for just, just enjoy some great food and hear more about the ministry uh, that we are doing in our small groups. Uh, two other events just quickly want to re re-invite you to. Uh, first is on Sunday, September 18th. There's a baby shower for Dan and Taylor Setnar's baby that's coming soon, expecting in, uh, they're expecting to meet their baby in October, and so we'll be celebrating on the 18th at 2 o'clock here at PCF, and you can see the registration details in the PCF News, you can RSVP to Emma Whitmer, uh, her information's in the PCF News as well, uh, 
Uh, while we're talking about kids, just want to say one more quick reminder for those of you who are still enjoying those bright green Bible Venture shirts, uh, if you would just bring those back to us uh, so that we can gather them up for next year uh, and return them to Mary Beal or Vicki Trehe. Uh, you probably already know who they are, but if you don't or don't know how to get in contact with them, just contact the church office and we'll make sure uh, to make that happen as well. Men, we have something uh, for all of you as well. Uh, there's a PCF breakfast on Saturday morning, September 17th at 8 a.m. Uh, so men of all ages, so men, your, your sons, you can bring your, your kids with you as well. Uh, we're going to meet uh, here for a breakfast at 8 a.m. It'll be a, a large breakfast, and then we'll hear a talk on uh, living out your faith uh, at work. How does work and faith intersect and interact? Uh, if you have any questions for that, actually, you can mention that or see Topher White, uh, and he'll be able to clarify that for you. Well, this morning, is, I want to remind us that it's a communion Sunday. You can see the, the plates out here in the front, and I want to remind us both to prepare our hearts, but also uh, that as we did um, last month, we'll be sharing glimpses of God's grace in our lives, and so we'll have an opportunity for you to share uh, glimpses of God's grace uh, that have been worked out in your lives. So just want to prepare you for that so you could be thinking about what God might want you to, to share during that time. This morning, I, to start our worship, I'd like to hear, have us hear God's Word calling us to our time of worship this morning and inviting us to uh, bring our whole lives as worship to God. And in this invitation, let us also hear that uh, the infinite greatness of God, the God of our worship. This is from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Our great God is King forever and ever. And as our God and King, our object of worship, He also deserves our obedience to His reign and rule in our lives. Full obedience to God as we desire every follower of Christ to be lived out, our lives, to our faith to be lived out, and which is impossible to do on our own because God is perfect and holy. And so we need God's grace through Christ in order to live in obedience to our, our God and King forever and ever. And so to just admit our weakness, to confess before God our weaknesses, I'd like us to start with a short confession that I'll lead, and you can respond as the congregation. And then I'm going to give us a moment just to silently confess uh, at our seats before the Lord. Lord, your word warns us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Lord, your word also assures us, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take our sins before God in a moment of silent confession. Let's start out by confessing the ways we have failed to love those around us, the way God seeks and desires us to. Let's also confess the ways we have fallen short of loving God with our, our whole hearts. Now, if you would, everybody look up and let's 
tell one another, remind one another of the proof of God's amazing grace by reciting the truths that are displayed up here on the front wall as our assurance of forgiveness. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you extend your forgiveness, your grace to us, Lord, through Jesus, Lord Jesus, that you gave yourself that we might be reunited, restored, renewed, remade, Lord, that we would spend eternity with you forever and ever. Lord, you are a good God. Thank you that your forgiveness is free, that it just takes our confession and then our repentance to turn from our sin and turn to you. Lord, you are good to forgive. You are good to give life. Where there was death, you have given life to us. Lord, we want to lift our worship to you now. Lord, pray that you would put wholehearted worship on our hearts, that we would give ourselves in worship of you, that you would help us not to be ashamed of you or your gospel or your word, but proclaim it as the truth that brings life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and worship our sovereign God. Immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, by grace. Unhasting and silent as light, nor wanting nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, I soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all my
Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my shield and my strength. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. Lord, be our strength. You are our saving refuge. We are your your church. Please bless us and be our shepherd and carry us forever.
by your grace and mercy, Lord, we are yours. And whatever befalls, we are yours. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you this morning because you are the great triune God. You are one God in three persons, each fully God, yet still one God. And Father, we confess that while we know this to be true, we often struggle to understand it. We often struggle to, to wrap our heads around it and, and know what it means, and, and often we accept it by faith and struggle. But Lord, we know that this is just one more way that we see how unlike us you are, how much more, how much more glorious, how much more transcendent, how much more majestic you are than anything else that we see in our world or in our experience. So we praise you because you are mysterious. You are beyond our ability in so many ways to comprehend. And yet we also see, Lord, in these truths that are beyond our understanding, ways that this teaches us about the way the world is and the way that you have made us. Father, we know that from eternity, you have been in perfect loving relationship with your Son and with your Holy Spirit. That you did not create this world because you had a need for relationships, because you were in perfect relationship among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past to eternity future. You had no need for us, yet you made us. And you made us in your image, which means like you, we are creatures made for relationship. We thank you, Lord, that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our sins can be forgiven and we can live in relationship with you. Your Holy Spirit dwells within us. We have every day, every moment, your presence with us in relationship. But more than that, Lord, you have given us relationships in the body of Christ and in the church. And Father, on behalf of my family, I thank you for the body of Christ. We have felt it so dearly these last weeks as we've left our son at the school and then he's been injured. We have felt the love. We have felt the prayers. We have felt the caring. Thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us without one another, but you build us into Christian community. Never let us take that for granted. Never let us misunderstand how precious it is, how you've given it to us for our good and for your glory. Yeah. So Father, I pray for those in our midst who struggle to find Christian community. Lord, I think particularly of those in our church family who are in long-term care facilities, who are unable to be with us on Sundays, who are unable to come out to our events in the week. Father, raise up from our midst, brothers and sisters, to visit them mm -hmm. and to love them well. Father, as we prepare to kick off all of our activities this fall, help us to value the opportunities that these give us to be with one another, to open your word together, to share our lives together, to love one another together. 
Father, I pray for PCF kids as we get ready to kick it off and for all the teachers of the PCF kids, of Children's Church, of, of the nursery that you will raise up. Lord, give them hearts for the children to show love mm. and teach our children from an early age the value of loving relationships within the church. Mm -hmm. Help them to teach the word well as well. Father, I pray for women's Bible study as it prepares to kick off, that the women of PCF will be blessed by the Christian community and the word study that they have in those times. And Father, as Christian community, keep us praying for one another. I do pray for Bryce this morning as he continues to heal and for his appointment on Tuesday, that his jaw will be aligned and that he will not need surgery. And Father, we have so many others in our church with injuries, with long-term illness, battling cancer and other chronic diseases. Father, help us as community to come alongside and love them well, to support them. Help us be the hands of Jesus Christ in caring and loving for one another. So Father, as we come to the word together, we pray for Stephen, that you will give him words to speak, that the word will drill deep, and because of that, we will love you more, know you more, and love one another more. We pray in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Thanks for modeling what you prayed for. It was beautiful. Children, if you are second grade or younger, you can go to Children's Church now. And we in this room are coming to Psalm 10. Last few Psalms of the summer, 10, 11, and 12. This morning we're on chapter 10, Psalm 10. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn over to Psalm 10. If you need a Bible, raise your hand up in the air and Jake and Rod will hand you a Bible. And in just a moment, after I see everyone's gotten, gotten to a Bible, I'm going to read this uh, inspired Word of God for us, Psalm 10. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. 
Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Amen. This is God's word. In 1960, C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy Davidman, died of cancer, metastatic carcinoma. And Lewis grieved very deeply. He had been married like toward the end of his life. He was older. He loved his wife, Joy, deeply. And in his grief, he filled four notebooks with venting, frustration, trying to process, articulate his grief and his anger and his bewilderment. The next year in 1961, he published a book you might have heard of called A Grief Observed, which was um, again kind of a memoir of his season of grief. And I want to read you a famous paragraph from that book, A Grief Observed. Here's what Lewis says. Meanwhile, where is God? When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting, and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so once, and that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander? in our times of prosperity, and so very absent a help in time of trouble. I think it's worth saying that Lewis's experience there is not a universal one. Many people have found God's deep, clear presence in the midst of their grief. And Lewis's steps on Douglas Gresham once pointed out that the book is called A Grief Observed, not The Grief. It's just one experience of one person walking through a really painful time. And yet many, many people have felt that sense of divine absence in the midst of hardship, difficulty, suffering. They've wondered where God is in their trouble. One of the most famous sufferers in the Bible, Job, cried out to God, said this about God in his suffering. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there And backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. He's looking in every direction, and he doesn't see, he doesn't sense, he doesn't perceive God. And so Job asked God, why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? Sounds very much like Lewis's question in A Grief Observed, where is God? And maybe you felt that way at various points in your life. Maybe you feel that way now. You wonder where God is. If that's you, Psalm 10 is speaking your language. And I say that particularly because of the very first verse In Psalm 10, I hope you still have it open in front of you. Look down if you do. Verse 1, here's the psalmist question. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In other words, where is God? God, why don't I feel you? Why don't you make yourself more known to me? Why don't you deliver me immediately? Why don't you help me? Why don't you heal me? Whatever it is, the problem, why don't you fix it? Why? 
And I want you to see something very important right off the bat here about Psalm 10. And it's this. The question in verse 1 is never fully answered in the psalm. You can look down through it. By the, the time you get to the end of the psalm, the psalmist still doesn't know why. God never says, here are my top three reasons for not intervening in your life. Here are my top three reasons for not making my presence more clearly felt by you. But I also want us to see this. There is clear progress in the heart of the psalmist over the course of Psalm 10. He doesn't receive a full answer to his questions, but he does grow. What we see in the course of this psalm is that God shows us enough of himself to sustain our faith in him in a broken world. God doesn't answer all our questions. He doesn't always intervene immediately. He often doesn't do the things we want him to do. But God shows us enough of himself to sustain our trust in him in the midst of a broken world. And the question is, will we have eyes to see what he shows us of himself In verses 2 to 11, the psalmist explains what is troubling him so much. What it is that provokes, that squeezes out this cry in verse 1. Why, oh God, do you hide yourself? We see the impetus for that in verses 2 through 11. And what the psalmist says in verses 2 through 11 is really ugly stuff. You know, the Bible is not a naive book. It's not a, a book that doesn't touch down into reality. Our family is reading through Genesis in our family devotions at the the moment, and this last week we read Genesis 34, and it's such a graphic chapter that I briefly, before reading it this last week, I briefly thought about not reading it to my family because it is so very graphic. It's about the rape of Jacob's daughter, Dina, and then the reprisal upon the person, the guy, and all all the males of the town who raped Dina by Dina's brothers, Simeon and Levi. And I said to our kids after reading that chapter with them, Genesis 34, if anyone ever tells you that the Bible is simplistic, that it's naive, that it doesn't actually intersect with real life, just tell them to go read Genesis 34. You could say the same thing about verses 2 to 11 of this psalm. These verses are realistic and they're they're kind of dark. So the psalmist's problem is with the wicked, those who are convinced there is no God and that therefore they are not accountable to him. So notice in verse 11, the end of that little section, verses 2 to 11, that the wicked says in his heart, in other words, that's important, he's saying in the deep central core places of his life. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. It's such a striking difference here because in verse 1, the psalmist is downcast that God has hidden himself, that God seems far away. But in verses 2 to 11, the wicked is delighted by that same thing. He's not sad that God seems absent. He's happy because it means he can get away with whatever he's able to get away with. He's not accountable to someone over him. In this case, the wicked is out to harm the poor and the innocent and the helpless, those with less power, influence, resources than he has. I mean, if you want to see whether these verses are an accurate description, just read the newspaper, read the web. I mean, it's, it's all over our world today. We see injustice. We see the poor getting poorer, the helpless not being helped, the the weak being oppressed. And the psalmist is wrestling with this. You know, I've noticed something about people over the years that very often the best leaders are also the best followers. I think it's a really important principle. If a person doesn't have the humility to be led, I don't want to ask that person to lead other people 
The same pride that will damage your relationships with those over you will also damage your relationships with those under you. And that is very much the case with the wicked in the psalm. So notice the emphasis on their pride throughout verses 2 to 11. They're arrogant. They boast. They're supremely confident in themselves. And it's because they don't relate rightly to God over them. They say, there is no God. I'm not accountable to a God. It's because of that that they don't relate rightly to those who are weaker, those who are under them. And the real problem is here, this is what really provokes the psalmist's cry in verse 1. The problem is the wicked are still doing well. The the wicked are this way, as described in verses 2 to 11, but they're still doing well. Verse 5, his ways prosper at all times. I mean, it'd be one thing, if their plans were failing, if they were getting what they deserve, if God was vindicating the poor and the helpless and the weak, but it doesn't appear to be that way, that's not happening. And so out of that tension, as the the psalmist sees how wicked the wicked are and how prosperous they are, out of this comes the cry of verse 1, why, O Lord, you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I wonder, do you ever feel that? Um, Do you ever struggle emotionally with the fact that nasty people get ahead and God doesn't stop it? I I really struggled with this emotionally a number of years ago um, after reading the biography of Steve Jobs and learning how like throughout his life, many times he, he hurt people badly. He trampled on folks, yet he changed the world. He was highly praised. He's often regarded as a great man, a genius. And I just wondered, as I read, why why do things work this way? Did he get ahead because he was the way he was? Did that allow him to achieve more? Why doesn't God step in, intervene, right wrongs, make things right? Why does he hide? And Psalm 10 does not answer that question. In fact, if you look down at verse 13, toward the end of the psalm, you'll see that the psalmist is still asking more why questions. It's not just verse 1. It's verse 13 he's still asking why. God does not reveal all the answers to him, but God does show him enough of himself to sustain his trust in him in the midst of a broken world, a verses 2 through 11 kind of world. You can see that the psalmist's faith in God is still holding because in verses 12 and 15, he's still crying out to God to act. He's still saying, God, help. Verse 12, arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. And verse 15, break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. That's his power. That's his strength. So metaphorically, break his arm. Stop him. Hinder him, break his arm, O God, call his wickedness to account till you find none. So you notice the psalmist doesn't see God. He, he, maybe he doesn't feel God. He still feels like God is hiding, but even though he doesn't see him, he's still calling out to him. He's still asking for his help. That means he's still trusting in him. What is it then that keeps the psalmist believing? If he can't see God, if he doesn't feel him, How is he still believing in him? And I think the answer is God sustains his faith by the truth in verse 14 and verses 16 through 18. God shows us enough of himself to sustain our faith in him in the midst of a broken world. And I think the truth that God shows the psalmist is there in verse 14 and there in verses 16 through 18. I want you to see three key truths in those verses. Number one. God does see. Number two, God has helped. And number three, God will act. So verse 14, the psalmist says to God, but you do see. For you note mischief and vexation that you may take it into your hands. You know that one-way mirror in the police station, all the crime shows, the bad guys sitting there being questioned, you know, it's a one-way mirror. 
The fact that the bad guy can't see the police officers doesn't mean that detectives can't see the bad guy. The, the fact that we can't see God does not mean that God can't see us. And the psalmist says here in verse 14, he does see, we are not hidden to him. He knows our struggles. Nothing is hidden to him. Even if we can't see him in our present circumstances, it's important to remind ourselves that he has helped us in the past. He has intervened in the past. I, I, I know you know that. I know you can point to times, maybe this week, where he has helped you. There's this long track, track record of God's faithfulness in the past. Verse 14 says this, to you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. And by the way, notice that the character of our God is diametrically opposed to the character of the wicked. The wicked sees a helpless person and he, and he thinks, easy target. And God sees a helpless person, the fatherless, the widow, and he says, how can I help? Um, David's pastoral prayer earlier was a reflection of the heart of God. God sees people in long-term care facilities and says, how can I help? The wicked says, how can I benefit? How can I prosper? God says, how can I serve? Over and over, God has helped the helpless. It's his character. Psalm 34 verse 18 says, our God is near to the brokenhearted and he saves the crushed in spirit. That's who our God is. God does see. God has helped in the past many times. And God will act. And we see that in verses 17 through 18. O oh Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. Future tense. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. So that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. So maybe God isn't acting the way we want him to right now, but he's going to bring justice. He will do it. He's going to bring justice. It might be in this life. It might be in the life to come. I wonder if you remember what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. This struck me for, for many years. You know, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. I mean, Jesus is saying over and over, blessed are, blessed are. He, he, it means happy. Um, God's going to provide for them. He's going to help them. He says, blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the meek and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you say, well, why are, how are they happy? How are those who are mourning happy? How are those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness happy? In what way are they blessed? And the answer Jesus immediately gives in those Beatitudes is because they shall be comforted. And because they shall inherit the earth and because they shall be satisfied. Those are future promises. They're not yet. They haven't in inherited the earth yet. But they're gonna. In the future, God will act. He will bless. He will provide. So God does see. God has helped. God will act. These are not full and complete answers to the question in verse 1. Lord, why are you absent? Why? Why are the wicked prospering? Why are the poor poorer? Why are the helpless trampled? Why, oh God, why do you stand afar off? Not complete answers, but they're enough to sustain the psalmist's faith in God in the midst of a broken world. By the end of Psalm 10, the psalmist still doesn't have all the answers he wants. He doesn't have an answer to the question in verse 1, but he hasn't given up. He's still coming to God. He's still crying to God for help. He's still asking. He's still trusting God. He's seen enough to keep going. And if you're in a darkened room, just imagine you're in a darkened room, maybe your bedroom. You're stumbling around. Maybe uh, if you, you're married, maybe your spouse is still sleeping. You know, you, you don't want to turn the overhead light on. It'd be nice to just flick the switch and get total illumination. But maybe, sometimes, maybe just the, the light from your, your cell phone screen Maybe that's enough. Even though it's not full, vivid, total, complete light, maybe that's enough to find your sock drawer or to find the bathroom door. Maybe just a little light is enough. Think about how what the psalmist does see of God really helps him. 
Uh, think, think about how those, those three elements that he knows about God, think about how those help him with the why question from verse 1. Even though they're not full and complete answers, think about how they help him. Here, here's what he learns. Whatever exactly God's reason for not intervening, for, for not being more present, for not being more felt, whatever his reason, it's not because God doesn't see our troubles. It's not because God is ignorant. It's not because he's too weak or too busy or too distracted because God does see. And whatever God's reason for not delivering now, the psalmist knows it's not because God doesn't care. He knows it's not because God thinks the poor, helpless, and weak are too far beneath his notice. They don't deserve his attention. And the psalmist knows that because God has helped the poor, the weak, and the helpless in the past. So he knows it's not that God's saying you're not important enough. And whatever God's reason for not acting immediately, the psalmist knows it's not because God has just resigned himself to allowing the wicked to get away with it permanently. God's just said, I give up. It's not worth intervening. The psalmist knows it's not that because he knows God will act eventually to bring justice. Maybe not now, but in the end. So those are partial answers, but they are important and they are helpful and they are sustaining answers. They're enough to keep trusting God in the midst of a broken world. Like the psalmist, we do not have all the answers to our questions, do we? Especially our why questions. But we have even greater light than the psalmist did because we live on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we've seen more of God than the psalmist saw in this psalm. So think about how the cross helps us to consider those why questions. The cross of Jesus shows us that God doesn't just see the sufferings of the helpless. I mean, this is unbelievable. Wonder of wonders. God doesn't just see the sufferings of the helpless. God himself in the person of Jesus Christ becomes helpless. He doesn't just behold suffering. He does suffer. That's how much he loves us. God becomes a suffering human being. He sees and he suffers. Not only has God helped the helpless, but he loves the helpless so much that he's willing to not help his helpless son hanging on the cross. Yes, he helps the helpless, but it's even more powerful that he doesn't help his helpless son. Why doesn't he help Jesus? When, God said, when Jesus says, God, why have you forsaken me? Why doesn't God, why doesn't God just bring the, the legion of angels down to help his son? Why does he leave his son battered, bloody, under his own wrath, suffering infinite hell? Why doesn't he help? And the answer is because he's helping us. Jesus is standing under God's wrath in our place. He's substituting himself for us. And then think about this fact that the cross of Jesus shows us that not only will God one day carry out justice on the wicked, he already has carried out his justice against us. He's carried out his justice upon us, and he's done it not by pouring his wrath on us, but by pouring it upon his son. Jesus went through hell. He went through separation from God. He underwent the wrath of God on the cross in our place. So we've already had justice served. If we're in Christ, if we belong to Jesus, that justice God is going to bring has already, for us, been brought on Jesus. The cross of Christ does not completely answer our why questions. But it shows us even more than the psalmist did. And it sustains our faith in God in the midst of a broken world. A month or so ago, Em and I watched the movie 13 Lives. Maybe uh, some of you have heard about that movie or seen it. It's about the 12 young boys and their soccer coach 
who were, were trapped by floodwaters in a cave in Thailand in, I think it was 2018 or so. I mean, I remember this when, when it happened four or five years ago. And, but the, the, the thing I, I hadn't really realized, that these, these boys are trapped way back in, you know, it was deep waters. You had to, to dive to get to them. It was kilometers and kilometers back in, so it was a six-hour dive. And what I hadn't realized was these rescue divers, to get these 13, 12 boys and their coach out, 13 people out, they had to sedate the boys in the coach because if these boys and their coach had been awake and alert, they would have panicked in those six hours. They maybe would have pulled the, the mask off, the oxygen tank, they would have died. And um, so as I watched that movie and reflected on it later, um, I, I had this thought that sometimes maybe it's much better for us not to know everything. Um, may, maybe the way those 13 people were saved was that they, they weren't alert for those six hours. Maybe if they had been, you, you think, okay, the best way to get these people saved is to make them ultra alert. But it's just the opposite. It was much better for them to know nothing while the experts did their work. Sometimes that additional knowledge we crave, the answer to the why questions, would be very bad for us. We would love to know why God does what he does, why he doesn't do what we want him to do, but maybe, maybe he has really good reasons for not telling us everything. Maybe it's better for us if we simply receive what he has shown us, if we treasure the things he has shown us and we allow them to guide us and help us and strengthen us when things are hard and confusing. He'll show us enough of himself to keep us trusting. Over the past couple of weeks, I've had this quote from John Newton rattling around in my head. It's quoted several times in that book by Tim Keller that was our PCF summer read, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And this is what John Newton says all shall work together for good. Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. That's probably the best line of this entire sermon right there. John Newton, amazing grace author. Take a photo of that, write it down, put it by your desk or your bed or the kitchen sink and think about it. All shall work together for good. Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. We can believe that even if we don't have all the answers. God has shown us enough of himself, his character, his past, his future plans, his promises, that we can keep trusting in him. So in your struggles, in your suffering, learn from the psalmist. Consider that God does see. God knows everything you're experiencing right now, stuff no one else knows. There are struggles you have that probably no one else is aware of. God sees every one of them. He knows. So meditate on his knowledge. Think about it. Let it strengthen you. The fact that he's not turned a blind eye, that he's aware of every struggle, every difficulty, every heartache. And God has acted. Think about it. Think about just his faithfulness to you, or maybe as you read the Bible, make a collection of all the ways he's served and helped the the helpless and the poor and the weak, his people, over thousands of years. And just let that fill up your tank of faith. Meditate on those things. And God will act. There's coming a day of perfect justice. There's coming a day where wrongs will be righted. Get up on tiptoe and think about those things. And Sing, sing hymns. The last verse of almost every great hymn is, is oriented toward the final future. Read those. Let them stoke your faith. Grow in your confidence that God will act. God's shown us enough, so let's, let's look to those things and trust in Him. Father, we want to grow in our faith. We don't want to minimize the struggles. Uh, the struggles are real. And they are hard. And think of C.S. Lewis losing his wife and just feeling a profound absence, a slammed door, and the sound of bolting on the inside. Many of us have felt that at one time or another, or will feel it in the future. 
I thank you, Father, that you've shown us enough. And certainly as we come to the table, as we reflect on the self-sacrifice of your son, as we reflect on the fatherly sacrifice that you made in giving, surrendering your son, we see things that the psalmist did not clearly see. And I pray for us, if we're maybe in the midst of the crucible now, maybe in the coming weeks we will enter it, that you will call this psalm to mind, and you will call this table to mind. And show us yourself and sustain our faith. Lord, even as we share some glimpses of grace now, I pray that we'll practice what we just saw in Psalm 10, that we will strengthen the faith of one another by reflecting on your past goodness. You have helped the helpless and the weak. You have. You've helped us. We've seen that maybe this week. Maybe we've read about it in a verse or a chapter. Maybe we've seen it in little or big ways in our lives. So Holy Spirit, just even right now, just bring to mind some of those things so that we can share that with one another to encourage and strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to do what um, Jeff mentioned earlier in the service, and um, we did this last month as well. Just have a, a family time. We're coming to a family meal, a covenant meal, the Lord's Supper. And before we do that, we just want to have an opportunity for the family to minister to the family to share glimpses of grace, just things that you have seen of God, God doing, maybe in your life or the life of others, or maybe in the Bible. And it doesn't need to be fancy, articulate, or profound. (laughs) It can just be simple. It's just the family members strengthen family members by pointing us to, to God. So Jake's got a microphone in the background. I see Gavin's hand first. Uh, wait till you get the microphone and then just share briefly with us if you would. You don't need to come to the front, but you can. <laughs> All right, I'm here to offer you hope. That if what I have to share uh, resonates with you both, perhaps now or even in the future, then wear it. In November 71, Jill and I got married the day after Guy Fox. Perhaps uh, appropriate because Guy Fox in South Africa is when you need of firecrackers and rockets, etc. Five years later, uh, our marriage crashed, primarily because of my unfaithfulness. And we were desperate. Borrowing from the sermon, we were desperate. Uh, We didn't know which way to turn. God was not absent. Because he reached down to Jill and I, and we came to know him. We were born again. Last November, we were married for 50 years. (laughs) So all things are possible with God. In the life group uh, a while back, one of the questions was, what are you most proud of in your life? I couldn't answer it. Neither of us could. Because the only thing we can boast of is what God has done in our life. That's it. It's nothing we've done. It's everything he's done. And Ecclesiastes says that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And we didn't know that. But once we embraced Jesus and he became our Lord and Savior and our reason for living, he became the first strand Not the third strand, the first strand. And my exhortation to you is, as I say, if if you can find a place for our testimony in your life, if the shoe fits, wear it. God needs to be the indispensable first strand in your relationship. Mm, Thank you so much, Gavin. Yeah, really appreciate that. Anyone else want to share a glimpse of grace, God's goodness, God's kindness? David. Yeah, because I haven't said enough already today. (laughs) Um, 
I just want to point out God's grace in many ways. Um, as many of you are aware, two weeks ago, Joy and I um, hugged our son Bryce and left uh, the campus of Cedarville University in southwest Ohio. Uh, it was a hard time for us, um, A, because he's our, our youngest, and B, the furthest away we've uh, dropped any of our kids off for college. And as we were preparing to leave and as we left, um, we felt the love and prayers of our church family um, sustaining us and sustaining Bryce through that. And then a week later, when we got the phone call from the EMT that Bryce had fallen off his skateboard and likely broken his jaw, um, obviously we were grateful for what appears to be the protection that God gave him that he uh, ho hopefully got a follow-up appointment Tuesday, but it does not at this time appear that he needs surgery or to have his jaw wired shut, even though it was broken in two places. Uh, but we felt very strongly um, all of your prayers to sustain us and help us through that time, and I'm going to try not to cry again. <laughs> but the reality of God's blessing to us through Christian community has really washed over us and overwhelmed us during this time. I love that. Praise God. Yeah, that's his faithfulness. Yeah, someone over here? Yeah. Can, would you like to share? Yeah, good. Just wait till the microphone comes around. Jake's hustling up the aisle here. Going as fast as he best you can. Okay, this is really cool. So I went to a baseball game um, yesterday, and w what happened was, so I, I went to go see, I went to go meet the mascot, uh, Wooster, and, um, and I, and I basically, I'm, I, I met him, and then, and then a little while later, this kid that works at the park comes over, and his, his name was Connor, and, um, you know, and he says, you know, hi, my name's Connor, and all this stuff. And he said, and he said he used to have been a bunch of places. And I, what, so I have CPM, and and at one point my mom noticed that um, uh, Wooster had a bit of a gait when he was walking, and and the the, the, the he and the, and the, and Connor said, Wooster and I both have CP. Now, if you p put it together. Not a lot of kids have CP, and the, the fact that, that there were two people that had CP is not very likely. So, very likely, I, I very likely I I got to meet the person that was behind the costume. So that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So I just want to thank God for that, and I and I got his phone number. So hopefully that's a good and fruitful relationship for me. And uh, and I, I'm grateful for the baseball that I got. You know, I got a signed baseball from both of the mascots. You know, and all. And all these things, and I'm I'm just very grateful for that time that I got spent with my mom and with Connor, and I'm just I'm very grateful for that because God is amazing. Hey, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks for that encouragement. We could just go on and on, and actually, you can go on and on. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we're not limited to this little slot. Um, let's talk to each other after the service or this week. You know, have people over for a meal and just offer more glimpses of grace. I, I want to bring us to the table now. Um, we're going to take symbols of Christ's broken body and Christ's shed blood. Uh, these symbols are for folks who are trusting in Christ and their sin is forgiven. So if that's not you, I would invite you to trust in Jesus and uh, allow Christ to, to bear the wrath of God for your sin, to substitute for you on the cross. It's just a simple prayer. And then you could take these symbols for yourself. Uh, symbols are also for those of us in right relationship with one another. So if you need to extend forgiveness or receive forgiveness, I'd encourage you to get right with someone if, if that needs to happen, and then take the, the bread and the cup. We're going to wait and take them together. Uh, we'll distribute the, the little um, cups with the little wafer on top. And then um, after they've all been passed out, we'll, we'll, first we'll eat and then we'll drink together. And that's because we want to show our unity in Jesus. We are together the family of God. Would the ushers come forward?
I want us as we, uh, as we come to take the bread to think about the depth of God's searching, finding passion for us. First of all, choosing us in Christ before the beginning of the ages. Before we were even here, he saw us in Christ and chose us. And then he has plans for us that extend all the way into eternity to come. And in this little gap of our lives, maybe 70 or 80 years, he's drawn us to himself. He's awakened saving faith in us. He's allowed us to repent of our sin. He's awakened our hearts, our blind eyes and hard hearts to see and treasure Jesus Christ. And he's redeemed us justified us he's sanctifying us he's working in us by his holy spirit he's preparing us for the new heavens and new earth forever with him he loves us so much he doesn't just see our troubles he's taken our troubles upon himself at the cross and this little wafer is a sign of all that and we we take it into us we don't just look at it we don't just feel it we eat it we are We are united to Christ through faith. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. We're going to take the cup now. Again, a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus. The Apostle Paul talked in the book of Acts about um, the church of God that God obtained with his own blood. And we are the people of God. We are that church. He's, He's bought us with his own blood. Jesus said, this blood is the new covenant Juice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. So, Lord Jesus, um, we love you, and even more importantly, you love us, and we experience that, receive it at the table. Thank you that you are the host of this meal, and you welcome us here. Um, These symbols of your broken body and shed blood are the meal. It's a covenant remembrance meal. It's going to be fulfilled in the new creation. So keep us waiting, keep us looking forward, keep us hoping. Even when our questions aren't totally answered, give us enough to keep on trusting another day. Hear our praise now as we think about that future hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Through the dawn 
Please be seated. Receive the benediction. God does see. God has helped. God will act. So in that knowledge, with that confidence, go in peace to serve a broken world, to spread the the love of Jesus. Amen. Hey, brother. Guess what? What?